Hey guys, welcome to the first edition of A Brief History of Instruments, Orchestra Edition. Make sure through the course of this video that you write down the main points I go over. If you want to write down everything I mentioned, cool. Um, but the main things you need to know are going to be what's in the PowerPoint. All the extra stuff is going to be great, especially for those of you that want to continue music in some capacity, whether you want to play in college, uh, whether you want to play in a community group, whether you want to play in some kind of a band, anything anything like that. The extra information is going to help inform your music and help just make you better musicians all around. When you're done, there's going to be a quiz in the quiz section of Blend that you need to go through and answer. It's going to be very short. It's going to go over only the points in the PowerPoint. So make sure you take good notes, okay? Well, let's get to it. The violin is an instrument that goes back hundreds of years. The first violins that we can find at least were made in the early 16th century about 1530. The reason we think that is that this painting that's currently on this page at the very bottom if you look at the little baby seems to be holding what looks exactly like a violin. How long before this they were invented we're not 100% sure. This was in the 1530s uh, around the 1550s there were actually royalty asking specifically for violins. Violins, violas, and cellos. So that's the documentation we have. Um, we know where they came from, though. Um, in the 8th century, kind of towards the early to 8th century, that's the year 700, the Arabic rabab seen to the right um, became very popular. This is literally wood with some strings and a bow. Now, although the bow that you see looks very different than what we're used to playing, they actually are pretty much the exact bows that were used in the Baroque era. And you held them by the middle. These instruments, because they didn't have a body, were pretty soft, and that's going to be something that I talk about a lot going forward. Volume was a big issue with early instruments. Now, this led to the Byzantine Illyra in the 9th century, and eventually the European Rebec in the 13th century. Now, as they developed the instrument, they began to add a body, and in fact, the European Rebec had a really big, almost box-like body that was hollow on the inside, used to amplify the sound. In the space of the body, the Sound waves go into it, they amplify, and they come back out. The rebab, which has no body, would sound pretty soft. The European rebec that had a body but it was very, very square didn't amplify it as well as it could, which is why violins, violas, and cellos were eventually invented the way they were. The round body gives it not only you know a beautiful shape, which is something that they cared about, but amplified it very, very well. Now, originally on violins, they did not have a shoulder rest or a chin rest. They usually used a cloth on their shoulder to help it from moving. Um, they also had a shorter fingerboard. One of the big things about violins, and this is very different than what we think of, is that when violins first came out, even with all the things I'm going to talk about that made them softer than what we think of as now, they were viewed as too rough for royalty because they were so much louder than everything around them. They amplified the sound well, so they were loud compared to everything else that did not have very good amplification. There were brass instruments at the time, but even them, even they were not that loud. So the violin came along, and the viola and the cello, and they were much louder. But they eventually became popular and won out. One thing that made them softer, but gave them a beautiful sound, are the gut strings. Now a lot of people say that they were cat gut strings, but generally speaking they were goat or sheep gut. So they, they were made out of the guts of an animal, but it wasn't cat. Right? It was just animals they were eating at the time. What this did is that gut strings have this really warm, beautiful sound, but because they're made from an animal, they can dry out and they can crack, and they're also very prone to changing their intonation whenever the weather changes. Right? The more organic you get, the more that the temperature and the humidity affects it. So they were very unstable strings, but they sounded really nice. Now the fingerboard was shorter, because those high notes, the highest, highest notes in the violin, sound kind of screechy, right? You can play them beautifully, but if you shift your mindset back 500 years, if you thought a violin playing normally was too loud, imagine what those high notes sounded like. So there was no need. So the fingerboard was short. One of the makers of violins was Antonio Stradivari, who was one of the most important luthiers, people that make string instruments of all time. His instruments were made so well that not only do we still use his measurements for the instruments that he wrote down, that he would use, but we also can't, with all our technology, make instruments that sound as good as his. Now part of that 
is because string instruments get better with age, and his instruments, because he was alive in the 1700s, are 300 years old and they're still being played. The more you play a wood instrument, the more the wood matures and it sounds richer, it gets louder, it sounds better, it gives you more room to do things. New violins or violins that don't get played very often don't sound as good because the wood is either immature if it's new, or wood can actually die if it's not played for long. So the longer you play an instrument, the more valuable it is, the better it sounds. Eventually, they added the chin rest in the 1800s, the shoulder rest. They extended the fingerboard so you could access more notes. They also raised the bridge a little bit. And what that did is that it gave you more room to push into the strings and get more sound out of it. So if you look at a modern violin, all string instruments are built relatively the same. You have your scroll at the very top, the part that actually loops on itself. You have the tuning pegs. Double basses have machine tuners there because their strings have so much tension uh, that wooden pegs will not hold very well. You have the nut, which is the part uh, right underneath the tuning pegs where the strings slot into, the little slots there. It's called the nut. It keeps them from the fingerboard. Then you have the fingerboard itself. You have the bridge that holds it up from the strings. It has to be placed very particularly because it affects how much sound you can get out of it. It affects how long the string is. Um, there's a very particular construction to that that I'll explain in a second. You have the F holes where the sound comes out of this amplified inside the instrument. You have the tail piece that the strings attach to. On a lot of modern violins, you also have fine tuners there. On older violins and professional violins, you don't always have fine tuners. You just have to tune with the pegs. And then you have the end pin, which is where the tail piece attaches to, usually with a little kind of loop thing, and also where the chin rest can attach. Now, inside the violin are two very important things. Underneath the lowest string is what's called the bass bar, and it runs parallel to the fingerboard along the top part of the violin. What this does is that it helps to strengthen the body of the violin, but also helps to amplify the sound of the low strings. The low strings of the violin are the softest strings because they don't resonate as well. The high strings pierce. The sound waves carry really far because they're so close together. The low strings don't do that as well, so they have the space bar to amplify. And on the opposite side, underneath the E string, underneath the high string, you have the sound post. Now, those of you that have heard me look into some of our cellos before, um, the sound post is really important for a couple of reasons. It goes between the front and the back of the violin, so it's perpendicular to the fingerboard, goes up and down, and it helps to transfer the vibrations from the face to the back. This helps to make the sound richer and louder. But what it also does is it supports the front face of the violin. If you think of any time you've pulled a string, as you pull a string out, it wants to push down. So as you tighten the strings, it pushes down on the fingerboard. If you didn't have that sound post on the inside, and there'd be nothing to support on the inside, and it would collapse in. Now, violins don't have the most amount of tension. Something like cello would definitely snap because the tension's so high. Something like the bass would collapse immediately because there's, there's too much tension on it. But even a violin can be damaged. You can warp the instrument or break it. If all the tension is released from the instrument, either you take off all the strings or just the bridge falls over, that sound pulse can fall because it's held by the tension of the bridge. It's usually just a millimeter, maybe even less shorter than the length of the inside of the body, so that when you put tension on those strings, it pushes the face down just a little bit so it fits really snug. It also is placed in a very particular spot so it supports as well as it can, and also so it transfers the vibrations well. Now the tuning on all the instruments from this family of instruments, so if you remember me in class talking about this, violin, viola, cello are the same family. Bass is actually from a different family of instruments. This family of instruments are all tuned in fifths, meaning if you start from one note, from one string, and you go up five notes, you get to the next string. G is one, A, B, C, D is five, etc., etc. So on the violin you have G, D, A, and E is the highest. Violas are down a fifth, which gives them access to more notes. Cello is an octave lower than that. And basses are tuned to fourths. So it's the same idea, but you start on the bottom note and you go up four notes. And actually one of the things about bass is that the strings are in reverse order of violins. 
So the lowest, and we'll go over this in the bass video, but the lowest string on bass is an E, and it goes backwards that way, because it goes a fourth. That also tells you the relationship between fourths and fifths. They're the reverse of each other. So thank you for listening to this video. Please remember, after you're done with this, to go into Blend, go into Quizzes, and answer the set of very easy questions. All the questions are going to come from this PowerPoint. There's not going to be anything from what I specifically said, but it would be good to, to keep that information. All right, love you guys, miss you guys, and I will see you in the next video.